as it's starting a bit, but it's taking a minute. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Brandon Tankot. Sorry for that slightly delayed start. I seem to have a little bit of a technical glitch with my microphone. Welcome to everybody that's in the room. You'll see in the chat box, I see everyone that's used to being here already has already put in their name and where they're from. So hi, Rona from Bedford Jew, it's fantastic. Philippa from Montreal. We've got people from Canada, Colorado, Dallas, people from all over the world. Thank you very much for sticking in and waiting for us to get started on this game with our It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Right, while we get started, the topic for today's webinar is the nine must-do actions to achieve wealth and financial freedom. So stay tuned for this inspiring session with Dr. Martini. I'm going to run through a few logistics for the webinar. Uh, the duration of the webinar will be about an hour long, so you want to make sure that you have a pen and paper ready, that you ready to take down any notes or anything that you may need to record about the webinar. I'm also going to tell you up front right now that at the end of the webinar, we're going to give you a fantastic offer to sign up and participate in Dr. Martini's two-day breakthrough uh, seminar, breakthrough experience seminar. Of course, this is not compulsory that you join the seminar, but we want to tell you up front that uh, we're going to make you this offer at the end of the webinar. Of course, the information here in this webinar is absolutely free, so please feel free to use as much of it as you can. As I said, make sure that you're ready to take notes, and we're going to be shutting down the comment section for the duration of the webinar so that you're not distracted by the presentation. So let's get started going over a, um, a few of the things that we've got in relation to the uh, topic for today. Um, and the objective of today is to use this time with Dr. Martini to give you a full set of proven action steps that will immediately begin your wealth and financial independence. Dr. Martini has made a list of nine must-do actions if you are serious about wanting to empower your finances and put them into action. You're not just going to be in a different financial position next year than if you don't. So you could call this your wealth building checklist. As I said, my name is Brandon Tankot. I'm a student of Dr. Martini, an entrepreneur and business owner. I'm also a fa father of a five-year-old little boy currently living in Johannesburg, South Africa. And it's an absolute honor and a privilege to host you this evening for this exciting webinar and to also introduce you to our presenter this evening, Dr. Don John Martini. Dr. Martini is considered one of the world's leading authorities on human behavior and personal development. He is the founder of the Dr. Martini Institute, a private research and education organization with a curriculum of over 72 different courses covering multiple aspects of human development. These trademark methodologies, the Martini method and the Martini value determination are the culmination of 44 years of cross-disciplinary research and study. His work has been incorporated into human development industries across the world. Dr. Martini travels 360 days a year to countries all over the globe, sharing his research and findings in all markets and sectors. He is the author of 40 books published in over 29 different languages. He has produced over 60 CDs and DVDs covering subjects such as development and relationships, wealth, education, and business. Each program is designed to assist people to activate leadership and empower themselves in all seven areas of their lives, financial, physical, mental, vocational, <coughs> spiritual, family, and social. John, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Good good evening and good morning or whatever time it is. Where we're <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. As I said to the audience, we're going to be going over a few questions we have in relation to the topic today. Um, so it's essential that you take special note to these nine must-do actions. So we're going to be running through. John, are you ready? Should we get started? I'm ready to go. Fantastic. So action number one, Dr. Martini, you say that you clarify purpose and to create a big enough why to match a wealthy desire. You also refer to knowing the reason for wealth as having a burning desire to serve humanity and building your legacy. Can you unpack this further and elaborate what needs to be understood and then what needs to be done to put this into action? Well, the main objective or the, the, of that principle, I'll give you an analogy or a story here. If um, you were behind, let's say you had a family and you were behind on your bills and, and struggling a bit, and you went to somebody and said, I would really like to borrow some money because I need to pay my bills and pay for, you know, groceries and rent and everything else. If you went to somebody and asked them, can I, can you help me? They'd probably say, thank you, but no, thank you. I've got my own challenges and my own bills. Uh, you'd probably say, no, they'd say, no. 
if you went to them and said, I'm, I'm current with all my bills, but I didn't get quite enough savings to help my kids go to college. Is there a way you could assist me in helping my kids go to college? Can I borrow some money to help on that? They'd probably say, thank you, but no thank you. Um, I've got my own children that I've got to pay for college. But if all of a sudden you went to them and you said, um, recently, my um, one of my children was killed in a car crash. And it's because she had to cross the road. My daughter had to cross the road across a busy intersection to go to the playground. And so since she's passed on now, we've just decided that we want to build a park in the remaining lot that's in our neighborhood and uh, buy the lot and build a playground there so the kids on this side of the highway don't have to cross the highway and take a risk. And if there would be any way you'd like to pitch in and participate in contributing to help us, in case you have children, help us build a beautiful park here so kids basically can be safer on this side of the, the road. Um, now the person would probably say, oh, because now the cause is bigger than yourself. It's bigger than your own individual family or your children. It's now going into a collective that encompasses the whole community or at least that side of the road. So the larger the, the goal, the larger the commitment, the more you and other people will most likely participate in the contribution or expenses of that project. Now, the, the reason I mention this is the greater the cause, the greater the potential for wealth that you'll extract from yourself. I had a lady <clears throat> many years ago that was a very successful broker in the financial industry. And she was a patient of mine and she'd come into my office and she was making very good money. I mean, quite a bit of money in a day at that time. In the process of doing that, uh, she was plateaued though and she wanted to make more income. And the only way she could earn more income is to have a greater cause, I felt. So I asked her if all of a sudden you were to um, die right now and you had 24 hours to live, what's not done? What's not complete? Or if this was your last year, what was not complete in your life? And um, she just paused for a second. She thought, well, the thing that I feel like I haven't done is I haven't assisted my mother. She sacrificed and worked two jobs to help us go through school. And I'd like to help my mom um, do something she's always wanted to do. And um, anyway, after discussing it, we came up with the realization that she'd like to build a theater, a major theater, and raise money to build a theater in the city of Houston. And uh, her clients and her, she initiated a cause to build this massive theater. I mean, it was a very expensive theater, nearly $100 million. And because she was inspired by the idea that I want to do that for her mom, she got involved in it, it took a six-year project to get it built. But in the six years, her mom was still alive. She made sure that the opening of this theater, her mom was there. Because of that, she literally went from 18000 a day in the financial industry to 45000 a day on average income because she had a cause bigger than herself. So having some cause, having some reason, having a big enough why for building wealth for yourself and the people you care about, your community, your, your family, your community, your city, your state, your nation, your world. The bigger the cause, the higher the probability that you will do what it takes to save, invest, and accumulate the money for that cause. Now, financial independence is nice. That's one. But that's just the beginning because that's obtainable, but you may have a bigger cause needed to get you in gear to do something extraordinary. Uh, you may want to go all the way to Mars like Elon Musk, or you may want to build a new city like Maha Sinathambi, but you need a cause to really build vast fortunes. And uh, so that's the point in the principle. Have some cause bigger than yourself to get beyond yourself. Thank you, Dr. Fontani. And actually, because you said that the most important thing was to adjust the hierarchy of values to match the level of wealth the person desires. You indicated that creating a bigger void and the six steps exercise is part of this. Can you take this a little bit further? Yes. I've stated before, and I'm going to restate it, that the hierarchy of your values dictates your financial destiny. Tell me what you value, and I'll tell you where you're headed with your money. I actually consulted with a gentleman who made $6 million plus dollars in one year. But at the end of the year, he had to borrow $327,000 to pay his taxes. And so it didn't matter how much he made. 
What mattered is how he managed what he made. And the hierarchy of your values determine how you manage it. And he had an assistant working for him that made only $24,000 a year. This is about 20 years ago. And um, what's interesting is she was saving 20% of it, and she was closer to financial independence. Somehow we're having some noise in the background. Not sure what it is. But uh, the one that was saving 24, making 24,000 was saving 20%. And so that person was actually going to be closer to financial independence. So it doesn't matter how much money you make. It has to do with how you manage what you make and the hierarchy of your values dictates how you manage it. Tell me what you value most, second most, third most, et cetera, down your hierarchy. And I'll tell you when money comes to it, how you'll spend it. So if your highest value is your children, your money will go to your children. If your highest value is clothes and looks and appearance, then it'll go to that. If your highest value is your religion and spirituality of some form, then you, you'll donate to the church or the synagogue or the temple or the mosque. If your highest value is, is uh, fitness, you'll go and do that. If your highest value is adventure, you'll spend your money on that. Whatever you value most is where your money goes. So if you don't have a value on wealth building, a true value on accumulating where you're wanting to buy things that go up in value, assets, instead of immediate gratifying consumables that depreciate, um, you're not likely to get financially independent. So I, what I did is I observed thousands of people as I'm traveling the world, <clears throat> how many people are basically, you know, saying they want to be financially independent. When you ask them, how many want to be financially independent? Everybody puts their hand up, but only less than 1% obtain it. And I found out that the people who obtained it had a higher value on wealth building and they would rather, you know, go for instead of immediate gratification of spending with impulse buying, they'd rather save their money and put it into assets that accumulated and that, that went up in value. They appreciated. If you don't have a value in wealth building, you won't put your money into something that goes up in value. You keep buying things that are immediate gratifying to go down in value and you are working against yourself. So you have to have a value on wealth building. And I found six things common to people who had a value in wealth building. And I call them the six steps to wealth <clears throat> because of it. And I'd like to go through those because a person who has these six steps in their value structure, uh, their hierarchy of values, have a higher probability of reaching, reaching financial independence. So the first one is, it's unrealistic to think you're going to be financially independent if you aren't serving people. You know, if you're not working and you're not serving people, unless you inherit money, or unless you somehow are married to somebody that's making money, which is still building a business, you're not likely to have a source of income to be able to save and invest and accumulate. So the first step uh, in wealth building is to actually, to increase the probability of wealth building and to have a higher value of wealth building, is to write down 200 benefits. And I mean 200, not 20, but 200 benefits of building a business that serves ever greater numbers of people. Because if you have a work ethic, you won't find a billionaire. Um, Richard Branson built a series of business, 300, 400 businesses that serve vast numbers of people. Bill Gates, massive business. Um, Elon Musk, massive business. Buffett, massive business. All the billionaires and all the decamillionaires and up all have businesses that serve vast numbers of people. So if you don't have a real value on that, I'd write down 200 benefits of actually desiring to serve people. Because if you're poor, it's because you're not caring about humanity enough to serve and make a source of income and making fair exchange and have an equity with people and making sure that you charge for services that you serve people. So 200 benefits of building a business to serve vast numbers of people, great number, ever greater numbers of people. And that means you have to care about humanity to find out what the great needs in humanity are and go out of your way to fill those needs. And that you've got to find the problems that the world is facing and find out a solution for it and to do it more effectively and efficiently than somebody else and do something that means something to you that you're inspired that you can't wait to get up in the morning and go and tackle. So you get creative in finding those solutions or find somebody that's already made the solutions and then broker that and communicate it. But there's got to be a service there. And if you don't have a caring desire to serve people, it's kind of unrealistic to expect wealth. So 200 benefits. Now, these are not 200 benefits of spending money as if you built the business and now you have money. Don't write 200 benefits. Oh, I can buy that yacht. I can travel. I can get that fancy car. I can do that. That's, that's the benefits of consuming and buying things that depreciate value. I want the, the benefits to be learning the art of leadership, learning how to manage people, learning how to listen to customers, learning how to, how to organize people, 
learning how to efficiently orchestrate priorities, things that actually it takes to build a business. The second of the six steps is 200 benefits of managing that business more effectively and efficiently where it's maximizing profits. Because I know companies that have huge business incomes, but very little margins. I also know some that have much smaller incomes, but greater margins. They make the same net return. So you want to make sure that you're putting 200 benefits of actually managing the business where it's making profits. That means working on the business, not in it. The first one, the first step of building a business serves the customer. The second one is also serving you and the employees to serve the customer. It's making everybody work more effectively and efficiently and making more profit margins for yourself and for the employees and to more efficiently serve clients so you can compete in the marketplace. <clears throat> the third one is 200 benefits of saving an ever progressive portion of the profits. Because if you're not saving a portion and building up a liquid cushion, um, you're not going to stabilize your business. You can always live on the edge. It's going to be anxious all the time. You're going to burn out on it. And um, you don't take advantage of opportunities when there's dips in markets and when you have opportunities to buy great opportunities to grow the business. So, you know, it's interesting that uh, right now Buffett has $109 billion in cash in his uh, reserves. Uh, Apple has $290 billion in cash in reserves. The biggest companies and the biggest and wealthiest people have cash reserves. They don't let the outer world um, volatilely alter their strategy. And they make sure that they have enough cushion to make it where the outer world doesn't mean anything. You want at least three months, maybe six months, and some people have it all the way to a year's worth of liquid capital reserved. The average 100 top companies have at least four to six months worth of liquid capital. And I, I know the Bill Gates and them keep at least a year's worth of liquid capital in Microsoft. That's $150, $60 billion sitting in, in liquid capital. So you want to save and you want to have a forced accelerated savings where you're increasing your savings every quarter. The second you get comfortable on your savings, increase it. And it's not how much you save, it's the habit of saving. So you want to make sure that you save uh, whatever you feel you can afford. And I've never met anybody that can't save something. You may think, well, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. i got bills right now. Well, you can just save a dollar a month. Well, yeah, we'll start. It's not how much. It's the starting. It's the habit development. You may make it to two and then four and then eight and then 16. It might grow, but you got to start somewhere. I know some people have started hundreds, some at thousands, some at tens of thousands. But whatever it is, you want to start and make a habit of it and do it electronically so it's not emotional because emotions destroy wealth and strategies, electronic strategies help you build it. And just automatically take it from your business, primary business account right into a savings account. I call it the immortal savings and never, never touch it. Even though it's a reserve, you don't touch it unless it's truly an emergency. It's gone. It's into savings. It's now working for you. And if you don't have it saved and invested, you'll be working your whole life for money and not have it work for you. So you need to write 200 benefits of saving an ever progressive portion and increasing it. Out of all the things I've done in wealth building, that was the most significant thing that grew my wealth was actually saving an ever progressive portion of it and growing it and accelerating it. The second you get comfortable in whatever you're saving, push it just a little further. I always say raise it 10% every quarter and watch what happens. You'll double your savings every two years and that will just compound amazingly over time. The fourth of the six steps is 200 benefits of investing in ever greater degrees of leverage, learning how to actually stair step the classes of investments and move up the ladder. So you're actually increasing your yield and getting greater degrees of leverage, a little bit more risk and reward ratios, but higher yields and learn how to build brands to leverage and learn how to do secondary incomes and learn how to basically uh, use sometimes other people's money to help you grow your, your, your business. So you want to leverage and that's basically on networking. There's many ways of leveraging, but if you want to master the art of leveraging, and so 200 benefits of increasing the investments into higher class, higher yields, higher risk reward ratios, and higher leveraging. The next one is 200 benefits of accumulating a vast fortune. If you don't have a reason for doing it, you won't. And financial independence is just the beginning. Uh, you know, when you reach financial independence, you go, okay, now what? I've done that. Now what? What am I going to do for my kids? What am I going to do for my family? What am I going to do for my community? What am I going to do for the world? You want to go and think about a bigger game and 200 benefits of that, because if you do, you'll do it. If not, the second you get to financial independence, you'll buy clutter and you'll have stuff run you and your vanity will basically overrule you. So the, the last step, the sixth step is 200 benefits of creating a financial cause that leaves a legacy. This goes back to the first thing I mentioned about having a cause. 
The greater the cause, the greater the potential for wealth. You'll drive yourself to do something if you have a bigger cause. You know, it's amazing what you can do if you have something that is so important to you that you're not going to let anything stop you, not even your own fears. And you put yourself on the line with a collective group of people to push yourself to find out what you're capable of doing. So, again, building a business that serves greater, ever greater numbers of people, making sure that you manage the business where it's more effective and efficient, maximizing profits, make sure you're saving an ever progressive portion of the profits. The next one is a, investing in ever greater degrees of leverage. Next one is accumulating vast fortune, accumulating a growing fortune, and then creating a financial cause to keep it growing so you have something perpetuity. 200 benefits of each of these will raise wherever financial wealth building is on your values and increase the probability of you seeing opportunities, taking deci making decisions that are in your favor financially, and also taking the action. Because you're, you can have control of your perceptions, decisions, and actions. If you have a high value on something, you alert and have the highest awareness, perceptions, and decision-making process. You're quicker and more efficient in those areas if you have a value on it. So I don't find people that have a value on everything but money getting ahead financially because you, you, you keep spending money on those other things. Everybody has their wealth in the form of what they value most. If they don't have a value on financial wealth, it'll be in the other forms and never be back into the financial form. And the financial form is one of the most universal. It has the most applications. So it's to your advantage to actually do the six steps to wealth, but 200. And you may stop and get plateaued and go blank. Put it on a computer and then come back to it and keep working on it. The people who have done, taken the time to keep doing it and not write, do not write as benefits and 200 benefits as of things about spending money. If you're writing the benefit to spending money instead of actually saving and investing and accumulating it, it's, you're going to be basically working yourself um, against your financial independence. You don't want to raise your lifestyle unless you raise your savings and your taxes equal amounts to keep yourself in check. That way you make sure you incrementally, consistently get to raise your lifestyle through time instead of living beyond your means. Most of the people out there in the world today, you see these big fancy houses and cars and things of this nature, and you think, oh my God, they're financially wealthy. A lot of them are broke. They're barely making it. And in fact, when downturns occur, they have to sell their homes and their cars sometimes. So even brokers in the financial industry are stuck in this. It's not uh, sometimes what it looks like. You wanna make sure that you're really building wealth that's solid, not just appearance, because otherwise your lifestyle will rule you and um, not your wealth, building your wealth uh, to do something great. Because when you're doing something you love to do, that's what wealth building does. People say, well, why would you want to build wealth? And so it's just to accumulate money? So well, no, because what it does is it gives you the freedom to do what you love and love what you do and not have to go to work, but you go to work because you love to. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, these guys still work because they love to. Oprah, they do it not because they need the money. They do it because they're inspired to go make a difference. So those are the six, six, six steps to wealth, and I am certain that they can help you increase the probability of you perceiving, deciding, and acting in a way that brings you wealth. Thank you, John. Those are really powerful six steps exercise. My favorite concept that you speak about is increasing your deserve level to increase your wealth. You mentioned in part of this is clearing out shame and guilt. Can you explain a little bit more detail the idea of increasing your deserve level and why that's important for wealth building? and then elaborate a little bit on the actions you would recommend someone take. Yeah, what, what happens is, let's say you're in a financial transaction, you're, you've just sold a product and somebody's paid you for it. If they pay you less than what you both agreed to, you tend to get um, a little angry at it, you tend to be narcissistic and you say, hey buddy, you owe me the money, you owe me the difference. And so you get narcissistic when you feel you've done a service or provided a product and they didn't pay you what you agreed it would be worth. On the other end, if you are in a situation where you did a service, they paid for it, but you don't feel that your product or your service delivered quite as much as what they paid. As a result of it, you'll have a built-in thermostat to say, you know what, I think I better give them a little extra to make sure they get a fair exchange. So you'll tend to be more altruistic when you feel that you haven't given your side of the bargain and you'll get narcissistic when you feel that they haven't given their side of the bargain. So anytime you've done something less than what you provide, or you think you've caused more pain and pleasure to somebody, you get altruistic and sacrifice, and you feel kind of ashamed. And anytime you do something you feel you've done more than that, you get narcissistic and feel kind of proud. Pride tends to make you narcissistic, and shame tends to make you altruistic. 
Well, when you're altruistic, if you go into a, a business transaction, you'll tend to negotiate, negotiate away your profits on the negotiation table. If you're narcissistic, you'll try to get as much as you can from them and be unfair. Both narcissism and altruism ultimately, ultimately underlie some of the things that undermine wealth building. It's when you're authentic with yourself and you're in a state of equanimity, you're not exaggerating or minimizing yourself, not pride or shame, and you're in a state of equity with them, you're not minimizing them with resentment or putting them up on a pedestal with infatuation, but you've leveled the playing field that you have the highest probability of sustainable long-term transactions with people called fair exchange, and there's inequity. That's why they call it shares and equities in the financial industry. You're sharing in, in an equal manner. You want a relationship when you're married that somebody is a match that you respect. You want to be in business with people you respect and have a balance to. And when you have wealth and a cushion of ca capital, you're more likely to select the clients that are more in line and you respect instead of being desperate and taking anybody. So shame and guilt underlie and undermine wealth building because it makes you tend to feel that you owe people things. And so anybody that comes along, there's an opportunist. And anybody there that feels like they want an open hand, a, a charitable thing, they can come to you and you'll be willing to give out and you won't value yourself. So here's the exercise I would encourage people to do, is to make a list of everything that they've ever think they've done that hasn't lived up to expectation relative to themselves or other people. Something they feel guilt about, shame about, or feel like they, they, they don't want people to know about. They don't want to hide. They don't want anybody to see or know about. Make a list of them and find out how whatever you did served you and others, the people specifically that you thought were shortchanged or hurt by it. And go and find out the other side because in the Breakthrough Experience, the program I do, that's my signature program, I, I help people break their shame and guilt every weekend we do this. If they've been storing from decades in some cases, and the second they clear it, they open up the gateway now to receive. They don't even realize that the bur burden of shame and guilt in their life from all the things they think that they haven't lived up to or they've done some harm somebody is actually keeping them from feeling worthy enough to receive and hold on to money. So we go in there, we sh in the break, so we go in and show them how to clear the shame and guilt. And it's eye-opening to see that. The number one thing that Foster Hibbert, who worked on Napoleon Hill that I used to lecture with, uh, that we said that the number one thing to stop you from building wealth and feeling worthy of financial freedom is shame and guilt. So by going and making a list of everything you've ever done that you think you've made a mistake on or hurt somebody or shamed on, and go find out how serve people. Because the truth is, no matter what you've done or not done, you're worthy of love. And no matter what you've done, there's two sides to it. There may be a downside, but there's also an upside, and people learn from it. And finding out how that serves people and serves you and clearing out all the shame and all the burden that you're carrying around will liberate you to feel, you know what, I deserve now. Your deserved level goes up when you clear out your shame and guilt. But if you go into pride, that's not to your advantage either. You don't want to go to pride or shame. You want to have self-governance where you're not proud or shame. Because pride makes you go out in the world and makes you project your assumptions onto the world as an entrepreneur. And you think, well, I know what's best for the customer. I know what's best for everybody. You become autocratic and you're not listening to the people. So both pride or shame can undermine wealth building. It doesn't lead to fair exchange. So in the breakthrough experience, I go through there and I show you in the Demartini method how to dissolve pride and shame so you have mastery of self-governance and you have more fair exchange between you and other people and you're now centered, authentic. And people trust people that are authentic. They don't trust people on the either side of the, the personas and masks that we wear. So let's clear out the pride and shame. Let's get present and let's have fair exchange. And that's one of the keys of building a business that serves vast numbers of people. Thank you, Dr. DiMartini. You've also said that there are nine things that were essential to have in place in order to determine if a person is serious about creating financial independence. Can you explain and then outline these nine things? Oh, I, I like this. This is, uh, when I was 28 years old, I got smacked, <clears throat> yeah, you might say, in the face with these nine uh, actions. And uh, it was a decision. It was a major decision point in my life. If I hadn't had this hit me by a gentleman named Jim McKinley, I don't know if I would have been where I am financially today. I, I um, So just listen really carefully because when people say I want to be financially independent, put their hands up. Um, I can tell if they're on their way to being financially independent if they can answer yes to all nine of these questions. If they can't say yes to all these nine questions, they really don't have a value in wealth building yet. That doesn't mean they can't. It doesn't mean they can't go and do the exercise I just said, clearing out the shame and stacking up the benefits. But um, 
let's go through those nine because they're eye-opening. And it'll make some of you have a knot in your stomach, possibly, and some of you go, oh, my God, I give up. Uh, but it, you have to face reality. Financial independence isn't because of praying and hoping and, and thinking prosperous and fantasizing and stuff. It's really a grounding process of basically serving people. So when I, when I finally got past the fantasies and got grounded and got how it really works, my wealth grew. So here we go. So you might want to write these down and take notes on these because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a – uh, probably as chilling as it was for me when I got it at age 28. But my life changed at 28. My financial journey began that time. Before that, I could save some money for things, a car, travels, books, and things like that. But I didn't actually save and invest money for financial independence until 28. And my life changed there. So here they go. Number one, if you don't know what your total assets are, you need to make a list of the total assets. Every financial asset you have it's a legitimate conservative number. Don't, don't exaggerate it. You know, you can have a house. You may think it's a greater house than it is, but the real dollar value, what it's worth in equity or what it's really worth at the sales price after all the cost, that's the true value. When you look at the stocks, it's not the high when it's above the mean. It's the mean and the average. Same thing for other forms of investment. You need to look at what your total assets are because if you don't even know what you have now, you have no foundation to know where you're starting from. The second one of the nine is what are your total liabilities? Because in all probability, some of you will have some debts out there still. I've, I'm, I'm, I don't have debt right now. I've been debt free for many years. <clears throat> but in my earlier phase of my life, that's not uncommon. You have mortgages, cars, payments, school loans, you know, who knows what. Um, but you want to go and look at what all your debts are. That's debts to other people in any form or banks or mortgages or any company. Once you look at your assets, total them, make sure you're clear, be conservative, make sure they're solid. Once you know your total liabilities, you now can determine number three, and that's your net worth. And that may be positive, it may be negative. In my 20s, it was definitely negative. In my, in my 30s, pardon me, it was definitely negative initially in the early 30s and late 20s. But then it became positive mid 30s, and it grew from there. But at first, you have to face the truth of where you are. You can't live in la la land. And you need to find out what your net worth is and get clear and total them. And it's actually eye-opening and it grounds you. You know, money circulates to the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. And those who have the least order around it and those, to those who have the most order. So whoever the most organized and more structured and objective about their money are the people that are going to end up having it. It's not going to circulate to people that don't know what to do with it. You, why, would, why would somebody give somebody money that doesn't even know what to do with it? So you're going to need to get the, the, the assets, the liabilities, and then the net worth. The fourth one is what exactly is the annual <clears throat> passive in income, passive investment income that you would love to live on per year? This is before taxes. How much do you want to live on? Do you want to live on 50000 a, a year, <clears throat> 100000 a year, a quarter of a million a year, a half a million a year, a million dollars a year, $10 million a year? What is it that you truly would pursue and want to live on? So you want to make sure you find out what that is so you have a goal. And what this does, it makes you, the next steps are going to make you real about this goal. Are you really serious about it or not? So let's just say we're going to pick $100,000 a year, U.S. dollars. Translate that to whatever currency you're in. But let's say it's $100,000. You'd like to make uh, at least $8,000 a month about $8,200 a month to make $100,000 a year to live on. I'm just going to pick a number because ones and zeros are easy to use. So that's number four. How much do you want to live on the money annually, passively from your investments? Not from working, but from investments. <clears throat> the next one, the fourth, fifth one, is what average interest rate do you believe you can earn with your knowledge in the investment world? Um, from money markets to bonds to T-bills to stocks to different types of stocks, different classes of stocks to real estate to commodities to art, whatever investments you intend to give to, to start accumulating, what is the average conservative yield, interest rate yield, do you believe you can get? Now, you may say something, you may want to fantasize about a high number, um, because you may have specialized knowledge, but that's an active trading process that might give you those numbers. But I'm talking about a passive investment vehicle or a series of varieties of them. What's the net? And you need to figure that number out. 
And I'm just going to pick 6% because I believe that pretty well with money in an index fund, most uh, uh, large cap index funds around the world, you could probably get that an index fund. But let's just say 6%. The next one is now you got to determine what exactly is the average inflation rate in your country. Um, and so on average, a hundred year inflation rate, not a short term because in the last 15 to 20 years, or maybe 20 years, we've had a very small uh, interest rate, I mean, inflation rate. But at one time in the 80s, it was way up in double digits. So right now, we're sitting at a low interest in uh, inflation rate. But average for 100 years in America is 5%. I use 5% calculations, even though it's higher than what is actually currently, because it's probably heading back up again. Now that the stock market's going climbing right now, inflation's headed up again. So in the process of doing that, and they're printing more money to disperse it. So in the process of doing that, you want to know what that inflation rate is because that erodes the actual interest rate you can earn on your investments. The next one is what exactly is the gross total, um, total investment net worth you have that you need in order to give you at that interest rate and an inflation rate the amount you want per year. So let's say you want $100,000 per year. You can earn 6% average on all your investments. You have a 5% inflation rate. Well, let's just take that. 6% into 100% is 16.66. You take 16.66 and multiply it times the $100,000 a year that you want. You need $1.66666 million in investments, earning 6% a year today, right now, to be able to live on $100,000. But you have to factor inflation in. So if inflation is 5%. So you take 1.6666, multiply it times 5%. That gives you about $53,000 or $4,000. Add it to the amount of 1.6666. It comes out about, oh, 1.73. Let's be on the high side of it. $1.73 million. If you have $1.73 million earning 6%, factoring in the inflation rate, Right now, if you had it today in your investments, you could live on a $100,000 lifestyle the rest of your life and never worry about it again. You've taken care of financially. Unless you want to raise the lifestyle, then those numbers will have to go up. But if you lived on a moderate lifestyle of $100,000 a year, you could do that. All you need is 1.73 right now. But now you're thinking, oh, now that I know that amount, I realize, hmm, I got a problem. I only have 50000 or, or let's say $50,000 net worth right now, and I need 1.73. So that means I need $1.725 million between now and some point today to be able to have financial independence. So there's a shortfall. You next, the next step is what is the shortfall? That's number eight. What exactly is the shortfall you have between your net worth and the amount of net worth you need? your current net worth and the net worth you need in order to have financial independence. And then when you do that, now you stop and you go, oh, I'm really short on this. So now you think, well, I got to gradually earn this over time and I got to save and invest it. So now you got to factor an in inflation in there to find out how long do I do it? So you say a goal, say, okay, 5% inflation means the cost of living is going to double in 15 years. So that means I'm going to imagine I'm going to work on financial independence over the next 15 years my 1.73 million is now going to require 3.4 million or 3.3 million dollars uh, later, 15 years from now, with a doubling of uh, the inflation. I'm going to need 3.3 million dollars in 15 years saved and invested, earning six percent to be able to live the lifestyle I want because my cost of living is going to be 200 thousand dollars by then. Now I think, okay, I need 3.3 million dollars. I've got 50 thousand. I need 3.3. I need to be saving 20 something thousand dollars a month. Whoa, on average. So now you're the next step, number nine is what's your strategy? Now, usually about that time when you look at that number, you either go give it up or I can't do that. Or maybe I need to lower the amount I want to have on financial independence. Now you understand why less than 1% ever make it to financial independence. They don't realize that it takes saving a good percentage of their money to be able to get ahead to make this happen. But they said, I remember reading about it many years ago, that if you're 20 years old, you need to be saving 10% of your gross income at that current lifestyle. If you're 30 years old, 20%. If you're 40 years old, 30%. If you're 50 years old, 40%. If you're 60 years old, 50% of your gross income to be able to have that type of money accumulated, to have that financial independence. 
and the average person saves one to three percent, so they never get there. That's why 99% of the people don't have financial independence. So when I got that number at age 28, and I looked at that, I went, oh, I'm not, I'm not able to save that. At the time, I was only saving $200 a month. And I thought, hmm, I either got to get into gear or to give up on my, I realized it's a fantasy if I'm not willing to go out and serve more people, build my business, those six steps. So then I, I sat there and I go, okay, there's no way I can start saving $20,000 a month. I'm not making that. So I had to do what is called a force accelerated savings technique. I decided I was going to start at $200 a month and I was going to accelerate my savings and I was going to make it every three months increase by 10%. Well, at first I went from 200 to 300 to 500 to 750 to $1,000 a month. And I was able to incrementally grow it and focus on growing my business. And then I started at 10%. And I went to 1,100 for the next three months, 1,210 for the next three months, 1,343 the next three months. I kept making it 1,464 the next three months. I kept increasing it by a Pascal triangle, 10% increase every quarter. And at first I was below that amount that I needed per month. But after a while I went above it because I'd start doubling and doubling and doubling the amount of savings. And I grew my business and I grew my brand. And all of a sudden I was saving more than I needed to get that outcome. And I ran a projection every quarter to see where I was now with my net worth. What, what is the shortfall? What is the goal with inflation? How much I'm saving? And I kept running it and paying attention to it. And that way I could see that my financial independence, which took originally 34 years in my vision, then it went down to 32 and it went down to 30, went to 28, and eventually went down under 10 and eventually five and eventually I made it. And then I started exceeding it. And I kept increasing the savings. And um, I followed a strategy, a force accelerated savings technique. And if I don't have those nine things in my mind, what is my uh, total assets? What is my total liabilities? What is my net worth? How much do I want to live on passively, annually? What exactly is the interest rate I can earn? What exactly is inflation rate? How much total net worth do I need earning that interest rate against inflation to give me that amount? Uh, what is the shortfall and what is my strategy? Those are the nine absolutely essential steps that if you don't have those in your mind, you're basically telling the world, I have no intention of being financially independent because it's going to take those things, not a wisp, not a fantasy, not a hope, not a prayer. It's going to take you grounding and serving ever greater numbers of people and learning how to build wealth methodically. So those are the nine steps. Thank you, John. Uh, another essential must-do action that you've mentioned is the law of sustainable fair exchange. Can you explain that a little bit further? Yeah, I, I did briefly mention it, but um, if we do not do fair exchange, nobody's going to continue doing business with us. If we feel that we gave more than what they gave us in a transaction, we tend to not want to do business with them. If we feel that... Uh, uh, you know, they, they gave us more than we do. We kind of feel guilty. Uh, and they don't want to do business with us anymore. It's only fair exchange, sustainable fair exchange that lasts, cause lasting relationships. I mean, even in, in your relationship with the loved ones, if they don't feel that they're getting a fair exchange, they're going to go somewhere else. People want to be loved and appreciated for who they are. And people in business want to have fair exchange. And uh, that's what builds trust. Trust is a byproduct of fair exchange. It's not about uh, what you say. It's about it's about having a fair exchange. And I've been in situations. I think most everybody out there is listening right now and viewing have had moments where they've been in a transaction with somebody and somebody didn't pay, and they felt kind of resentful to it, and they felt you know narcissistic and felt that they deserved and their deserved level goes up. And I've, they've also been on the transaction where they did a service and they didn't feel like they delivered quite what they hoped in that service, and they went out of their way to make sure the person was satisfied. You have a built-in thermostat for a fair exchange. It's intuitive, and it's trying to keep you in fair exchange to maximize your potential economically. And so that's the key. Sustainable fair exchange is the only thing that's working. You know, even Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett talk about in their book, Creative Capitalism. Uh, uh, Bill Gates, when he first started many years ago in the 90s or whatever, he, uh, he built a very big business and he accumulated a vast fortune, up to $81 billion at the time. But he was somewhat became a monopoly. Every computer had to have his software in it. And so after a while, it wasn't fair to the little guys and the other computer companies. And there was a monopoly. And the government stepped in and they created an antitrust and anti-monopoly systems. And all over the world, there were attacks 
on Microsoft and Bill Gates. And then as a result of it, he had to bring that back down and he went to started the Bill Gates Foundation for philanthropy. Now he's got a balance between give and receive. As a result of it, in his creative capitalism with Buffett, he outlines how important this was as his lesson. And so it's important to make sure you don't go over, overly narcissistic with pride or overly altruistic with shame, but to make sure you love yourself. Believe it or not, love is the key to, to financial transaction. I've heard over the centuries by ignorant people that somehow spirituality and materiality don't match. But the truth is true spirituality, which is equanimity, and true materiality, which is equity, are the same thing. And so if you really, really, I, I said at a church one time, if you're poor, it's because you're not caring about humanity and not going out of your way to serve people and maintaining fair exchanges with people. Go out and care about people. Fill their needs. Find a way of serving them. Do something that inspires you and have a transaction that's fair and you'll grow wealth. That's the first foundation starting point for grow, growing wealth. So, yes, fair exchange is the only thing that uh, lasts. And people that are autocratic and try to dominate and think they can get away with it, eventually it backfires on them. It's just a matter of time before nature catches it. So it's wiser to go and have fair exchange and sustain it and build it and keep doing it. Your brand, your integrity, everything are to your favor by doing it. I think that's the difference. And I, I'm going to make a confront here. In Wall Street, uh, it's happening right now in Wall Street. Right now in, in, in the Wall Street Journal, I saw it the other day, and also in USA Today, uh, Goldman Sachs, for instance, uh, they, there was a, the brokerage firms in Wall Street were basically feeding on ignorant people. They were basically uh, taking advantage and charging management fees, high fees, trading fees, and doing dynamic tra tactical transactions where they were going back and forth and trading high numbers and making a fee on all the transactions. And the net return wasn't even beating the benchmark and the indices out there in the marketplace. Well, people finally caught on, and Goldman Sachs literally has dropped through. They were 30 times the amount of income they were making 10 years ago. They've dropped to 130th the amount because people figured it out, and now they're going over to index funds, which is what I've been teaching for almost 30 years, to save their money and save their cost and, and, and educate themselves. In the process of doing that, Goldman Sachs is now having to pay for all the narcissisms and, and pay, taking advantage and exploiting the ignorant people, and now they're having to wake up and realize they've got to be back into fair exchange. So it's just a matter of time before fair exchange is the thing that makes sustainability. Thank you, Dr. Demartinla. Another essential uh, and must-do action is the ability to manage your emotions. Why is it so important when it comes to building wealth that you manage your emotions? Okay, that's a that's a very important one. Um, let's say that you um, have a million dollars. Your net worth is a million dollars, and you have it in various uh, vehicles of investment, different classes of investment. And let's say the market races the year you have them. That, that money in it, and it goes to 1.3, jumps up 30%, which is exactly what's going on in the market right now. Since Donald Trump got into office, uh, well, inaugurated in, um, uh, or elected in November, uh, I believe November 8th in 2016, uh, in that year that he was, from that year till now, the market has gone up 30%. So that means that if you had a million dollars in the last year and three months or so, you've gone up 30%. Now, when you do, it's very easy to be vulnerable to mania, to become extroverted, to think that you're brilliant, to think you know what you're doing with investing, and you think, oh, my God, I, I'm an investor. And you tend to be extroverted and ask people how their investments are doing. And you tend to think, well, my God, I could go and, and borrow money at 5%, 6%, 4%, and I can go and get double-digit returns. I'm a genius. I'm going to borrow money on a margin account and leverage it, and I'm going to go and make money off that. The problem is that the market itself is above the average mean. And so right now, people are just emotionally sentiment, and they're basically with this irrational exuberance. And so the market's in kind of a bubble. So you're not really buying quality, uh, intrinsic value of a company. You're buying smoke. You're buying people's mania. And so then when all of a sudden the market dips, which it's going to do soon, when it crashes, then what's going to happen is all of a sudden you now got to have a margin account. You're going to be in debt and you're going to realize you paid too much for stock. And then you were ignorant because you got manic and you got proud and you got elated. And that's why emotions can undermine wealth on that end. But let's say that you find out the market crashes and it does an adjustment. Like in 2000, when it adjusted in the tech sector, NASDAQ dropped 78%. Literally in a matter of a week or so, 78%. That's a massive drop. 
So now if you had a million dollars, imagine if it dropped to 200,000. Whoa, you'd be trying to sell out quick. You wouldn't probably have the skills to know how to short the market. You'd sell out quick and um, man, you'd be depressed. You want to sell out quick because now you're f frightened and you're depressed. And so you do foolish things with your money. When in actuality, when the market's crashing, that's the time to buy. And when the market is up above a really high percentage, might be wise to sell or at least just sustain it. That's why you need liquid capital and a cushion to make sure you buffer and mitigate the volatilities of your emotions because emotions destroy wealth because they get manic and they do foolish things using other people's money because you're narcissistic or the other, you're altruistic when you're frightened and minimizing yourself and feel ashamed, you give it to other people, you sell out. So pride and shame, greed and fear, the two basic uh, emotions, if they're taken to extreme, almost guaranteed to undermine wealth building and cause you to activate your amygdala, the, which is the animal brain, and animals usually don't become wealthy, humans do. You need to stay in your executive center, you need to have a strategy, you need to follow the strategy, you need to have a liquid cushion to make sure that the, the emotions are mitigated and you have capital. So if, if the market goes down, great, time to buy. That's why Buffett and these guys that have a lot of money keep a lot of cash on reserve. They wait for obvious crashes for the cash, cash for the crash. And then they take advantage of incredible deals. And then they make money without having to do much thinking. So it's emotions that undermine wealth and it's immediate gratification and gambling speculations that usually get you in trouble. And, uh, but it's a long-term visionary that usually gets ahead. And uh, I'm, I'm the turtle, not the, the, the tortoise, the tortoise, not the hare, as they said. And I watch a lot of people that are going all over the place doing and trying to get the quickest uh, get rich scheme, which is the amygdala, which is the gambling casino. When you're looking at investments and somebody's advertising fancy cars, fancy boats, yachts, uh, gold, diamonds, and everything else in the lifestyle, you know that they're not here to teach you about wealth building. They're here to capitalize on your emotions and sell you a fantasy. They're going to be wealthy, but you're not. But the people that are teaching you education about how money works, what psychology is involved there, and what actually goes on in the market, they're the people that are going to help you get along financially. So make sure you think about who you're actually interacting with and what you're learning. It's easy to get swayed by instant gratification and immediate gratifying, uh, you know, instant uh, overnight wealth things. It's all over the news right now and the media right now, bitcoins and things like that. There's all kinds of things, like overnight millions. Well, if it doesn't have intrinsic value, it may not be there tomorrow. Make sure you're buying true assets that truly serve people long term. That's how you build long term wealth. Thank you, Dr. Demartini. And leading to action number seven was to study everything you can about wealth building, saving and investing. Can you share an example of what you've learned that's had an impact on savings and investing? And can you share some recommendations on what you believe is wise to read or study on the topic? Well, when I first started studying at age 28, wealth building, I went to the gentleman who initiated the Institute, uh, the Association of Financial Planning, International Association of Financial Planning in Houston. He actually created it for the nation. Bright guy, very knowledgeable man. And I said, what does it take to be a financial planner and to learn how to build wealth? He says this and this and this. And he said, well, why don't I go through the, the curriculum? I'll do it on my own initiative, not to be a financial planner, just for my own sake. So we kind of started that journey. And then I started making a commitment to reading books. I think I've done about 400 books on, the, on, on uh, just investing and probably 1,000 books on something to do with money over the years. Because I used to just read them less than right. And each time you learn something, but I found out that a lot of it would fade if I didn't use it. And a lot of stuff I was reading, it was just scattering me around and, and I was confused because everybody, there's, there's a dialectic of opposites out there trying to tell you one thing, another thing. And so I figured out that it's wiser to develop a strategy. As you learn something, don't just read it, but start compiling a strategy. Get a mentor that is already much wealthier than you, that is similar in value structure to you, that you can follow along and get foresight and not have to learn through hindsight and trial and error, but educate yourself. And what I did is I found out that whenever I was saving and putting money in a money market, I was studied everything money markets. When I started buying bonds, uh, when, the, when the interest rates were higher, I studied bonds. When I started doing blue chip stocks and indices, I started studying those. I kept educating myself on what I was actually applying and didn't scatter myself with knowledge. And I found that I never forgot that information because I was applying it and using it. Knowledge that's applied is retained. So you want to do that. You want to learn. You want to become literate. 
Uh, there's Investopedia, which is online, which is a great educational, simple educational system. But I would start and read. And I think that the, one of the things that's probably wise to do is get old Benjamin Graham's uh, Intelligent Investor, which is basic, and, and start uh, learning. I think reading the investments by Warren Buffett, that is his uh, quarterly reports and annual reports, I think are worth studying. You learn about investing. But I, I would not, don't confuse the brokerage business and buying and selling stocks as a day trader investing. They're not the same. In fact, I went and lectured to a number of financial institutions, Merrill Lynch one time. I think I've done about 14 of them. And Merrill Lynch, um, I spoke to 200 brokers there, and I asked point blank, how many of you are financially independent? Two out of 200 had financial independence. And then when I confronted them, it wasn't barely financial independence. They were living a very high lifestyle. They were kind of like the wolf on Wall Street, uh, not on steroids, but on depressants. And uh, people were basically living beyond their means and they didn't have it. And they were the ones managing your money and they're buying and selling and making money off it. And I thought, this is nuts. This is a roulette game. And I thought, that's not real financial wisdom there. I want to know people that actually have a net worth that's accumulated it, that's sustained it, that lives moderately, that's living and, and uh, not living beyond their means, that is actually having their money grow and they're having a cause and they're structuring it. I'm interested in knowing what they do, how they do that and study that. And they're fewer in between. Like I said, if, if there's tons of stuff out there in the world on finances, but still less than 1% financial independence. In fact, I went and looked at the deck of millionaire list and it's 0.213% of the world's population become deck of millionaires. In America, it's 0.312%. In some countries, it's, it's a little higher or lower, but it's very small percent, it's less than 1%. It's only the two millionaires that make it into the 1%. The five ones make it to about 8.8%. 8, 8 that means very few people become these. And then you get a very small percentage that get into 50 million, 100 million, and into the billion marks. Very small percentage. Now, there's lots of them that are doing it out there, and you hear about them, but you don't hear about all the people that are actually not doing it. So make sure that you're mentoring under somebody that's actually accumulated. Make sure that you're actually uh, getting sound reason and not gambling, because there's a lot of people that want to gamble your money. Even the financial advisor that I study with uh, told me, don't ever trust somebody with your money. If they have a higher value on money than you, they'll get your money. They'll figure out how to get your money. Opportunities surround you. Make sure you actually invest your money wisely. That's why I, in the breakthrough experience, I teach people how to manage their emotions and have their intuition strengthened so they can catch people that are basically trying to take advantage of them in that way. So it's wise to learn that art and, and self-governing and study the heck out of it. If you really have a value on something, you study it. When you meet somebody you really value, you want to get to know them. If you really, truly want to build wealth, you will want to study it. You want to leave it. You want to study the statistics and probabilities and the math of it. And if that turns you off, oh, I don't want to know all that stuff. I'll just hand it to somebody else. You may get the right person, but you may find out that they actually have more love of your money than you do. And they may want to get your money. So beware, beware study it, value it, and appreciate what money is. Because it is a universal medium to allow you to do and empower many areas of your life. And it's a reflection of what service you provided the world. And you deserve to be rewarded if you serve vastly. Thank you, John. You mentioned that converting debt into a service is an important action. Can you elaborate on that a little bit further? As I'm sure a lot of people sit with that uh, first hurdle to overcome. Yes, if you, if you have debt in any form, <clears throat> educational debt, mortgage debt, car debt, uh, loan debt, any form of debts, um, don't be resentful to them. Be grateful for them. Um, you may have done some maybe unwise actions and got yourself and bought with, whenever you borrow money, if you borrow money for things that go down in value, you're burdening yourself with debt. If you buy things that go up in value, then that may have a value. If you're buying a business with debt, that could be a value. It may produce more than the cost of the debt. But you don't want to, if you're really interested in building wealth, you don't want to spend money on debt for something that doesn't go up more than the cost of the debt and earn it more to pay for the debt. But if you're having debt, my advice is to write down the benefits you've received of it. And don't stop until you have a tear of gratitude for it. Because it's easier to pay debt when you have your debt that you're grateful for. It's hard to pay debt for something you resent. They discovered this when they were dealing with divorces and men and women had alimony and child support. They found out when they appreciated the person and had any degree of appreciation, they had a higher probability of paying off those, those alimonies and child supports. 
but they had real major resentment. They were very slow on paying and didn't want to pay, and they didn't. They couldn't come up with it. And they come up with excuses why they couldn't pay. They even hindered their own growth of wealth so they didn't have to pay it. I've seen it many, many times. So you want to write down the benefits of what you actually have received from your from the loan that you got or the debts that you have, so you're not resenting it. That's number one. Because if you're grateful for it, it'd be easier to raise the money to pay it off. Number two, you want to take the total debt and calculate the total debt. Find out how much you're paying with the interest that you're paying on it, how much you're paying per year, how much you're paying per month, how much you're paying per week, how much you're paying per day, how much you're paying per hour. Chunking it down. Let's say you have uh, $240,000 that you owe, and you have to pay $24,000 a year on it, and that's $2,000 a month, and it's $500 a week, and it's $100 a day, and it's basically, if you work seven hours, it's $15 an hour. When you think of $15 an hour psychologically, it has a different feeling than a quarter of a million dollars almost in debt. So you always want to chunk, be grateful for the debt, chunk it down into small bites. Once it's down into small bites, you want to convert it into units of service. So let's say you're a doctor, and let's say you have an office visit of $60, and let's say you have an overhead cost of business of 50%. So you actually net $30 every time you do a, a, a office visit. And your, your debt is per hour, $15 per hour. That means you only need one half of a patient per hour to pay off your debt. And that means if you work eight hours, that means you need four patients a day to pay off your debt. And if you convert it into units of service, instead of focusing on the debt, once you convert debt into units of service and focus on serving people, your debt goes down. But if you forget the people that you're serving and, and you're focusing on the debt, your service goes down. It's where you put your attention. You want to service the debt by converting debts into units of service and focusing on serving people because you love making a difference in people's lives. You love the feeling of serving and, and saying, hearing people say thank you. You love having fair exchange transactions. Focus on it and convert it into that and structure the debt where it's automated electronically where you can't even mess it up. There's no emotion on it. You know, when you, when you have emotions and you have to pay bills with emotions, you distract yourself. But if you just do it electronically and it's just automated and it's committed and now focused on serving people, you're servicing the debt that way. You'll focus on growing your business. And after a while, the debt will seem like a small thing. It wasn't even much. And all of a sudden, you paid off your debt. Along the way, as you're paying your debt off, it's wise never to stop your savings. Some bean counters accountants will tell you, oh, pay off your debt. And then you can save. I disagree. I think it's wise to save right from the beginning and pay off your debt and accelerate both, but never stop your savings. It's a habit, because most people that never develop the habit of saving and they just keep paying off debt, the second they get out of debt, they or somebody in their family will want to go buy a new car, add on to the house, do furniture or do something and get further into debt again, because their life is about debt. You gotta realize that the average American and really around the world is pretty close, has 10% of their gross income on average on credit card debt per year. And the banks love with their fraction reserves and their over lending and everything else, they love giving you privileged credit cards so you can get further in debt so they can make the most money. But you need to make sure that you're paying off your debt, but at the same time, you don't want to rob your savings. My advice, if you can't pay off your debt every single month and keep it current, throw away your credit card, get rid of that, get something like an American Express that's accountable or an audit, audit, audited thing that is counted that you have to pay every month. If you don't make yourself accountable with your own value system, you need somebody to make you accountable and don't accumulate the debt unless your debt is making you more money than the cost of the debt and you're making a profit on it. There's no harm in going out and getting in debt to create a business that's going to pay it off and make you profit. That's wise. That's leverage. But to go out and buy something that goes down in value that you never you have to pay off, that's now burden. And that's raising lifestyle, which is decreasing the probability of building financial independence. So you want to earn the right to risk that way. And you want to make sure that you convert your debts into services and focusing on serving. So if all of a sudden you're saving and you're only earning 5% on your savings, yet, don't just pay off your debt and stop your savings. Put a, maybe 10% in your 90% in your debt, but never saving. That goes going. Then when you start to reduce debts, psychology is not as interesting wealth go, go up psychologically. So as your debt goes down, increase your savings. Don't wait, because if you have a, st a, a stall between the time your debt's gone and your savings are gone, your business will drop or you'll have an unexpected bill come in to do it, because 
If you don't bring neg entropy and order to your finances, entropy and unexpected bills take it away. That's why the wealthy always pay. They paid their savings and their mortal savings that they never touched. They paid their taxes. They paid their lifestyle, all budgeted, all electronically structured. And then they paid their business bills by priority. And they set up an investment account. They set up a vacation, an education, and a depreciation account and bills. They structured it. There's order to it. And therefore, more money comes to it. And you want to make sure you're doing that. The same when it comes to investing in, in, um, in education. You want to set a separate account for education, a separate account for vacations, a separate account for investments that you never rob, so it grows forever, and also your depreciation account, the cost of business. If you structure it and you manage it wisely, you get more money to manage. Thank you, Demartini. We've got the final ninth must-do action, which is you briefly mentioned earlier, was to surround yourself with people that are more financially empowered than you and to find financially empowered mentors to guide you. Can you elaborate and advise how they can play a role in helping us to build wealth and financial freedom? Well, unquestionably, if you hang out with people that have a lower value on money and have a lower net worth, if you're here and they're here, they're going to say, you're expensive and you're greedy. That's what they're going to label you when you actually try to go into a transaction. They're going to try to bring you down to their level of thinking. If you get around people that have a higher net worth, a higher socioeconomic, and a higher value on wealth building, they're going to see you as, they're going to think of you as cheap and too generous. Almost Most people will have recollections in their minds of, of memories where somebody looked at them and said, man, you ought to charge more for that. That's, that, that's worth more than that. Yet other people saying, oh, can you give me a deal? And that's based on where wealth building is in their value system. But if you sit there and buy into the person down, you'll go down with them. It's wiser to go and keep them, build them up, and help them go forward. Because I've never met anybody that gets up in the morning and says, I want less wealth, less income. I don't know of anybody that does that. They want to grow their wealth. They want to grow their potential. They want money working for them. They don't want to be a slave for money. They want to be a master of it. And you're not going to master it. So if you hang out with people that are higher in net worth, that are higher understanding, but also have meaning. And I want to make go off on this tangent. People that make money that don't have meaning, that don't have fulfillment doing it, more likely to go into the amygdala and blow it on, on the Wolf of Wall Street mentality. And uh, But the people that have something, they grow wealth and they have meaning, they do something they love. I think of people like Herbert Wertheim, a very wealthy man. He's done amazing things. He's got... 4,000 patents, he's, he's opened up four universities, amazing guy, he lives on our ship, he's an amazing guy. Uh, people like uh, Elon Musk and people like Bill Gates and them, they, they, they have some purpose in their life and they're building wealth not for the sake of just uh, to go party, they're doing it because they want to make a difference in the world. That's why the cause is so important, to, to keep the executive center over the amygdala when it deals with managing money. So you want to make sure that you, you actually are hanging out with people that have greater wealth potential, wealth uh, vision in you, manage it when, when you, because they're going to encourage you to go up. Because everybody in their value system projects their values onto you, and the people that have a low value money said, why do you need to do that? You don't need all that money. You're so greedy. That's, that's, uh, they, why don't you give me a deal? And the people that have a higher value and says, you can do it. Stretch yourself. Go out and serve more people. You hang out with people that are wealthier, you end up wealthier. You hang out. The number of people that you typically hang out with will probably tell you your net worth. You hang out with billionaires, you end up a billionaire. You hang out with millionaires, you end up a millionaire. And if you save an increasing amount, the people you hang out with will change along the way. So that's the best advice I can say is, now it doesn't mean you can't hang out with the other people, but when you're doing, serve them, elevate them up, serve, be a service to them. But if you want mentorship, hang out with people that are a greater in potential and they'll stretch you. It's just stretching that makes you grow. It's not the shrinking. Thank you, Demartini. And I know you travel the world and present your two-day seminar, the Breakthrough Experience, in multiple countries all over the world. Can you help and explain to us in the audience uh, how attending the Breakthrough Experience will assist someone in building their wealth and their financial freedom? Well, you know, the Breakthrough Experience I've been doing now for 29, yeah, 29 years now. And uh, my dream was to help people master their life. And I've done it now 1,121 times. And the way it's going to help somebody is I'm going to show them how to empower all areas of their life. Financial wealth building is one of them. But if you're building financial wealth and you don't have a stable relationship, you can erode it and cut it in half with a divorce. So I'm going to be talking about relationship dynamics. 
Uh, I'm going to show you how to manage your mind state and to govern yourself so you're not letting emotions interfere with wealth building. I'm going to show you how to access your purpose of a service in the world. So you have something specifically you want to go and make a service to to target what you can do to build your wealth. I'll talk about social leadership. I'll talk about vitality because if you don't have energy, I, I just spoke to a company the other day and I noticed that the they were up at 5.30 in the morning and having meetings. They're a tremendous amount of energy. It was a vital energetic group. And no wonder they're growing business and, and escalating because they're inspired by a cause and they're doing things that uh, serve them because they've got energy. So any area of our life that we don't empower is going to interfere with wealth building. So in the breakthrough experience, I teach people how to empower all those areas, how to raise their self-worth, how to dissolve their prides and shames, their infatuation resentments, how to get clear about their values, how to stack up the six steps to wealth, how to shift the values if they want so they can have a higher probability of having those wealth and seeing opportunities, how to utilize uh, manifesting things on how to be really clear and concise about what your purpose is, what you're thinking about, what you're visualizing, what you're talking to yourself about, what you're conversing with other people about, how to keep you focused and inspired towards an objective, how to make sure that you're using the resources most effectively, how to prioritize things. I mean, there's many people, I have a friend over there in Australia that's basically growing a vast fortune right now because he's followed the principles of the breakthrough experience. Pardon me, I just realized that my battery somehow I've been unplugged here. Pardon me one second here. I just realized that I was about to go off. First call. Thank you, John. You would have left me. Thank you. There we go. It's, it's now fine. I, uh, I was off there for a moment. But, but in the breakthrough experience, I help people master their lives. If they come in for financial independence, I help them build that, work on that project and start that journey trajectory. In fact, I was, uh, I was doing a program in Sydney, Australia. There's about 120 people there. And I asked them, how many of you have applied the principles of what they've gotten on the finances that I've taught them? And I was amazed that 87% had applied it. 87% had applied the principles which is, was mind-blowing. I, I, I didn't even get me close to that expectation. It was mind-blowing. I said, how many of you are making progress on your finances? How many of you are now not letting your emotions run you? How many of you are more stabilized? How many of you have a clarity of where you're wanting to go? How many have a plan of action now? And this is very high. So the breakthrough experience is a turning point from people's lives to be able to not let the world on the outside dictate their destiny. Everybody's getting up in the morning and dedicating their life to fulfill their dreams. And if you're not doing it yourself, somebody else is going to come in and override you. You got to be able to say no to all the people on the outside, say yes to your dreams, and then do your dreams in a way that's in fair exchange with people, not subordinating to people. I'm going to show you how to take challenges that you're facing in your life, no matter what they are, no matter what the distress is, show you how to neutralize them and turn them into opportunities so you see things on the way, not in the way. I'm going to show you how to take burdening relationships, whether at work or in social life or family life, and actually how to shift them in such a way where they're used to your advantage and help people in the process. So you have fair exchange. I'll help you show you how to get into your executive center where you get a nice inspiring vision and know what your mission is. And so you naturally wake up the leader inside you. And I'll show you how to empower the seven areas of life. So the, the, the breakthrough experience is something that's got a track record. Over 90,000 people have been to this and it makes a difference in people's lives. I just did a talk uh, last night in Denver to a group and I asked them how many have been to the breakthrough experience and how many have had a tra trajectory change and people started giving testimonials of what's happened in their life and it was really quite amazing and it's inspiring it's tear jerking so there's no way you can do the breakthrough experience without having an impact it's impossible and then you're going to learn something there that you can't learn anywhere else people say well is it like this seminar or that seminar I said no it's my life's collection of research that I've been accumulating for the last 45 years and it's summarized and synthesized and integrated. You're going to learn the Demartini method. You're going to learn how to do the value applications, determine your values, how to change the values, how to raise wealth building on the values, all these things that we've been talking about, and how to not to subordinate to people on the outside and inject their values and confuse yourself and distract yourself, be able to say no to things that are uh, opportunists that are trying to take your money, and be able to dissolve shame and guilt. I'm going to show you exactly what to do. You're actually going to do it and dissolve the shame and guilt so your deserve level is higher. And, then, and, I'm gonna, and any questions about wealth building, I cover. So if you ask questions, you come there and you have questions specific about your issues, 
I'll address whatever your questions are. We cover questions. We have time for questions on any topic. And uh, so the breakthrough experience is, is, I mean, I could go for hours on it. <laughs> I do. It's 24 <laughs> hours with me. It starts 8 in the morning and goes to at least midnight. And we go from about 9 to about 8 o'clock, 7.30 at night. And it's full on. So if you're ready to go and educate yourself and expand your game and play a new field of possibility, then the breakthrough is the thing. I, I can tell you, there's no way you can go there without having a, a, an upgrade in your game. Thank you, John. I can personally it, it recommend to the audience that they take up the offer now. But before we get to the offer, Dr. Martini, you said earlier in the conversation that a person must have to save in order to build wealth. So how does spending money on attending the two-day seminar, doesn't that contradict with the recommendation that we've made to the audience now? Well, that's a good question. And, and I have people sometimes ask me that. Well, I I'm, I'm now want to save. I don't want to spend it. I said something earlier that you may or may not picked up, and that was – you want to put together, you want to structure and organize your finances. This is so crucial and people ad hoc it and they don't sit down and structure it. You need to have an automated savings program in place. I can't tell you how important that is, but you need to also have a tax automated savings for taxes because you're going to pay taxes. And then you need an automated lifestyle budget, a committed budget that you're going to live on with a little bit of extra uh, play money just to make sure you have that for unexpected and for extra things you want to buy, but you need to have it fixed. You can't just let it run wild. Then you need to also have an education account because people who are not educating themselves are not expanding themselves are going backwards. There's, it's almost impossible today. If you're not keeping up with things, you're going to get behind. Look at the technology, how difficult it is to maintain and keep up with technology. But if you're not, you're going back. You're becoming a dinosaur. So you have to educate yourself. That's part of wealth building process. That's, that's one of the essentials. You also need to have a vacation account. Now, if you know that you're going to spend so many hundreds or thousands of dollars a year on it, it's better to chunk it down in a monthly amount at the end of the year than go take your vacation. The same thing for education. If you know you're going to spend a few thousand dollars a year on it, you need to break it down per month and put it in savings. That way you don't think about it and you never rob your actual investments. You've set up a separate account for it. The same thing for depreciation. If you don't have a depreciation account, it's almost insane. Because your computer is going to go down in three or four years or two years or something. Your cars are going to break down. Everything is going to depreciate its material. And if you're not setting aside money on a monthly basis to prepare for depreciations, you're going to get hit. And then you're going to rob your savings and you're going to beat yourself up. I see this all the time because people don't structure it. That's what I try to tell people in a breakthrough experience, how to structure it. Now, if you do that, you also have depreciation, education, vacation, savings, taxes. You structure it. And any other bills you know, if you know you're helping people or in a charity, a charity account. Whatever it is that you do, you need to structure it and allocate a certain portion every single month or every two weeks or every week into those accounts. And if you manage your money wisely, you attract more money into your business and into your life to manage it. So if an education that you take at any seminar, my seminar, or anybody's seminar, if, if you're going and you're not getting an investment return where it's, re it's giving you more than it costs, then it's not an investment. So you need to prioritize your education towards the goals that you have. Now I'm going to make sure, and I'm going to commit to this, that the, the seminars that I give, there's no way you can take that without it being an investment. I'm certain about that. You're going to do it. But you have to prove that to yourself as you do it. If you listen today, you didn't pay anything today, but if you listen today other than your time, you have to look, and if you didn't get something that's going to go out and make a change in your life, that's going to give you more than the cost of your time for being here, don't return to the seminar. But if for some reason you go and you got a value out of it, then that's an investment. That's part of the education process. And the people that I find that need the education the most are the ones doing it the least, and the ones that need it the least are doing it the most. So prioritize your education, put your savings into it, put education account into it, Find out what it is. Prioritize your education. Don't just go randomly and make sure you're getting a yield. If you don't get a yield out of it and you don't see a return on your investment, prioritize it in another direction. But make sure as part of your financial institution, you grow, you're, you're putting it in there and making sure that you're investing wisely in your education. Because if you're not educating yourself on finance, you're probably not going to do well in the financial world. If you're not educating yourself, as, as I remember <laughs> Warren Buffett said, until you can manage your emotions, don't ever expect to manage money. If you don't know how to master your emotions, which is a breakthrough experience, you don't know how to expand your vision to have it and grow your cause and do the six steps I'm talking about, 
the probability of wealth building goes down. So use it to your advantage and, and use your education wisely. And if some people, I sometimes I tell people to save and invest it over a period of time towards those in the, towards the education. Some people have it now. I've seen some of my students go in and buy the program and change their life immediately. And they started the savings program. They started their education. They went out and did the business that they want to do instead of working for somebody else all their life. You, by the way, if you work for other people, you're going to pay the most taxes and the least return. You work for yourself, you're going to pay less taxes. You're going to make more return. And if you invest, you actually pay the least taxes and you have the greatest return. So I say come to the breakthrough experience, but make sure that you start your education and your, your savings in addition to that. Thank you, Dr. DiMartini. And I'm sure a lot of the audience now would like to learn and how they can apply some of the fabulous advice that they've heard today and the amazing lessons uh, and how to come and attend the Breakthrough Experience Program. So I'd like to share with you the details at this moment for the offer with the audience. If you truly like to transform your financial destiny, then the Demartini Institute is a very special offer for you. If you click on the link to the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a little checkbox claim your 10%. If you click on that link to the right-hand side of your screen, and don't hesitate, book now. This is a limited time offer for webinar participants only. If you book on this webinar, you're going to get an extra 10% off the current advertised price for the breakthrough experience. Plus, when you book now, you're going to receive a free gift valued at $400, which is Dr. D. Martini's online module Inspire Destiny. That alone is worth the value in taking action and booking now, and we'll prep you and get you ready for the breakthrough experience. So click on the link to the right-hand side of your screen, choose your country, you'll see the flags uh, displayed there according to your country, Australia, Canada, USA, or South Africa, and book for the most powerful life solution seminar on the planet. This has been created by Dr. Demartini. Over 44 years of research and study has gone into this program. You'll learn two powerful processes, the Demartini method and the Demartini value determination process. They're practical applications to solve problems, balance emotions, and expand your life for fulfillment and potential. So the breakthrough experience will provide you with powerful solutions to help you resolve fear, depression, resentment, anger, intimidation, self-esteem, guilt, grief, or anxiety, or any emotion you would love to stop running your life. You'll learn how to solve challenges, build relationships, clarify purpose, achieve your goals, and so much more in the next two days. If you're a personal or professional and you want to take your life to the next level, I urge you to click on the link to the right-hand side of the screen. A few months ago, I had the privilege of being able to attend, often I'm, I'm all over the show, and I personally had a major shift in my marriage and in my life. And Dr. Martini, I want to thank you personally for doing that and being sitting there with me through that process. So this is something I put my heart on and personally I've seen many, many people's uh, minds open up, their hearts open up, and their perspective shift by coming through this breakthrough experience. So John, I just want to thank you again for your time uh, and teaching us these valuable tools in this webinar. Well, thank you for helping organize this. Um, just really, really recently, I saw somebody who um, attended the Breakthrough Experience. I believe it's eight years now. And um, they, they were at an evening event. And they came up to me and they gave me a hug. And I said, uh, wow, I haven't seen you in a bit. He says, I've been busy. I, uh, I started the mission that I started in the Breakthrough Experience. I started the company that I intended to do. It took me about eight months to get it moving, but it's up and running and it's moving and it's making money and I'm setting it aside. I'm methodical on my payments and everything else. It says, I was actually, when I went through some of the financial principles, I didn't know for sure if I was fooling myself and, and lying to myself about whether I really was committed to it. But I did what you said. I shifted my values. I prioritized the actions. I structured the savings. And I'm on my way to financial independence. I'm not there yet, but I'm probably four to five years away. I see light at the end of the tunnel, and I am very grateful. Thank you. I get to do the breakthrough experience every week, and um, about 40 times a year. And if you sat in on there and watched what went on and watched the transformations in there, you'd not wonder why I do it 40 times a year, because um, you see what results there are. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, just find a way of coming. It's an investment. It will pay off. Um, I will encourage you to start your savings. I will show you how to empower the seven areas of your life. 
and you're going to say thank you at the end. You're going to say thank you. You're going to have a tear of gratitude at the end of the program. And you're going to learn something that you probably could have gone your whole life and never learned in that program. There's some valuable, truly innovative information in there that's going to serve you. So find a way of coming. You'll say thank you. And thank you for listening to today. I know that if you go and listen to this again and apply what we just went over, I know it will help you. And you deserve to have the life that you dream about. You deserve to have financial wealth. You deserve to have a... a you deserve to empower yourself in all seven areas. You deserve to wake up your genius, have original ideas. You deserve to have a business that serves vast numbers of people. You deserve to have financial independence. You deserve to have uh, a relationship that's inspiring that you feel is a match. You deserve to have uh, leadership skills and, and a vital body that's energized. And you deserve to have um, an inspired life. And I, I, it's impossible to convince me you can't have that. It's work. It's not simple. It's not immediate gratifying. It's not this overnight quick get rich scheme. It's not this. It's the mastery of the principles that stands the test of time. That's why I want you to come to the Breakthrough Experience. Because I know that the material in there is going to be lasting. And you'll use that the rest of your life and it'll help you. So I I've, I've, thank you for listening today. Um, thank you for hosting or, or, or narrating it. And um, I look forward to seeing you at the next perfect time at the Breakthrough Experience or whatever I can do at the Demartini Institute to be of service to you. Please take advantage of our, our, our offer and the value online value education process we have. And I look forward to seeing you at the Breakthrough Experience or wherever we get to meet. And uh, thank you for being here with me today. Thank you, Dr. Demartini. And thank you to the audience. I'd just like to quickly take this opportunity to repeat that offer to you again. If you click on the link to the right hand side, and attend the Breakthrough Experience today. Of course, this is a limited offer for the webinar attendees only, so you're going to get a 10% off the current advertised price when you book the, for the Breakthrough Experience, plus the Dr. Demartini's Inspired Destiny course. So come and join Dr. Demartini. As he said, it's not a facilitator. You're sitting live with Dr. Demartini in person. He opens up his heart, his mind, his knowledge, his years of wisdom, experience, uh, and he will guide you and lead you through sometimes choppy waters, but through those choppy waters, I can attest that after that weekend, you're going to have those tears of gratitude. You're going to feel that breakthrough experience. So I would urge you to click on the link to the right-hand side, take up this opportunity, and solve any of these issues that are undermining the quality of your life today. You do not need to carry on in this vein. You can take action, click on the link, and I can guarantee you that by attending and spending 48 hours with Dr. Demartini, you will be able to get the breakthroughs in whatever areas and the seven areas that you're looking for. Thank you very much for everyone's time and attending. Dr. Demartini, as always, is a highlight of my mind to be able to spend this hour with you. And thank you to the audience for making this possible. The Demartini team is on standby and ready to answer any of your questions. Uh, and they are dedicated to answering any question that you may have in attending the breakthrough process. Uh, and also helping you to be able to attend the program. So please reach out to them if you have any questions or if you need any help booking with the program. The recording of this webinar will be sent out to everybody afterwards. So if you feel that this could be of value to anybody, and your friends, your families, and your coworkers, or anyone you work with, please share this with them. We would love for them to be able to attend uh, either the webinars in the future or the Breakthrough Experience or any one of the other Demartini programs. Thank you very much for everybody's attendance. I hope you have a wonderful morning, evening, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Brandon Tanko. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.